In this video, I'd like to tell you the story of how I met Jesus and how he plucked me off the road I was on and set me on a completely different path from a road of selfishness, materialism, and self-centeredness headed toward addiction and self-destruction to a road of grace, hope, joy, purpose, and right relationship with God. There are no words that can adequately, adequately describe what a great and loving Savior he is. If you don't yet know him, my desperate plea is that you will take the time to seek him and make the effort to find out if Jesus is who he claimed to be. When I was in ninth grade, I had a biology teacher who was the youth group leader at a local church. And during the winter of that year, the youth group had a retreat. He mentioned this to the class and invited anyone who was inter interested to come along. Though I had stopped going to church a few years earlier, it sounded like a good chance to get away for a few days with all-you-can-eat meals, a toboggan run, winter sports, etc. So a few friends of mine in the class and I decided to go. There were Bible studies in the morning and short talks at night, but all in all, it was a great time. Though I spent a great deal of time trying to convince the people I met that Christianity was just a fairy tale made up by people who were weak and needed something to believe in, I had to admit, admit that these people were really different they really believed what the Bible said. To them, Christianity was not just a set of rules, but a personal relationship with God himself. And the thing that impressed me most was how much they cared about each other, and in spite of the aggravation I was giving them about me too. After we came back from the retreat, I put what had happened in the back of my mind. A little later, an interesting thing happened. My best friend, John Maytuk, who had also come on the retreat, had started going to the youth group meetings and had become a Christian. We had many arguments over the next few years, but each year I somehow ended up going on the winter retreat. My senior year in high school, I went and as usual got into many discussions with the counselors, some lasting into the early hours of the morning, and I was convinced that my arguments against Christianity were right. My position was that God made my mind, and if my mind believed that Christianity was a fairy tale, and yet I tried to live a good life, then why would he send me to hell for not becoming a Christian? Of course, I realized after I became a Christian that what I was implying by this position was that God could not give someone a free will. In other words, I was putting my own human limitations on God. It came to the end of the retreat, and as usual, they had a service in the chapel. At the end of the service, they invited anyone who wanted to put their life in Christ's hands and seek his will for their life to come forward. An amazing thing happened. About 19 of the high school kids went forward. I stood in the back perplexed, and though I tried to fight it, there was a strong sense of God's presence in the room. The people who went for forward all started crying, and I just figured that they were all caught up in the emotion of it. But nonetheless, it did leave an impression on me that I had a hard time get getting rid of after the retreat. About four months after this, I decided I would resolve this matter once and for all. Though I did not believe in Christ, I did believe there was a God, so I figured I would ask him. I prayed that if God wanted me to believe in Christ, then when I went to get in my car in the morning, there would be water in my ashtray. I told myself that I would do this for a week and that I would not tell anyone about it and just wait and see what happened. The first day I went down and there was no water in the ashtray. I laughed to myself and figured that I was right all along. But before I would tell John, I would let it go the rest of the week. Each morning I went down to get in my car, and each morning there was no water. But a strange thing started to happen. On Thursday of that week, I began to feel very, very depressed, as if the whole sky were coming down on top of me. Now, I had been depressed before, but this was something different. I started to throw up and have diarrhea, and I knew that it was not just something physical. Friday afternoon, John came by to find out why I hadn't been to school. I told him what I had been doing, and he told me, that it wasn't a good way to go about it. He showed me some verses like, Do not put your Lord, the Lord your God to the test, and woe to the generation of signs. In other words, you cannot put God to a test. After John left, the depression continued to get worse, and feeling like I couldn't bear it much longer, I decided I would try to become a Christian for a week and see what happened. Not that I would recommend to someone to try this technique of becoming a Christian for a week, but that's what I did at the time. I asked that Christ would forgive my sins and come into my life and help me seek his will for my life. 
after I said that prayer, the depression went away. And though I still was not completely convinced, I decided I would sincerely try for a week. I started to read the Bible, praying before I read it that God would show me what he wanted me to learn instead of how I had read it before, which was just to look for contradictions. About three days after this, I had finished reading and I put out the light to go to sleep. Suddenly something happened that I cannot put into words. I felt as if Jesus were right in the room with me. What I distinctly remember thinking at the time was that I could have been lying there with no arms or legs and it wouldn't have made any difference. To be in God's presence was all that mattered. <clears throat> that was in June 1972. Since that time, my life has completely changed. I know beyond any doubt that Jesus is real. The Bible now makes sense to me. Before I felt empty towards many people whom I knew I should love, where now I can honestly say that God has given me a genuine love for all people. The Bible says that God has a specific plan and purpose for my life, and I know as long as I seek and trust him that he will direct me and that whatever happens, he is in control and working things out for the best. This is not to say that things will always be easy, but as Jesus promised, whoever comes to me I will in no wise cast out, and I will never leave nor forsake you. I found this to be true in my own life and have seen his invisible guiding hand time and time again intervening in my life. This along with the knowledge that whatever happens God loves me and I have eternal life with him has brought peace to the present that nothing in this world could ever offer. There is a parable Jesus told about building on the right foundation that you may have heard before. It's from Matthew 7 uh, verses 24 to 27. Therefore everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the storms, the streams rose, and the wind blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall, because it had as its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain come, came down, the streams rose, and the wind blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. The Bible states that none of us can make it to God on our own. I've heard an analogy that trying to get to God on your own is like trying to jump, the, uh, to long jump the Grand Canyon. Whether you're in a wheelchair with no use of your legs, or you are Carl Lewis, you may, you may remember uh, Carl Lewis um, is the greatest long jumper of all time. He won a uh, gold medal in the Olympics four straight times in 84, 88, 92, and 96. But if he tries to long jump the, the Grand Canyon, he's still just going to end up on the bottom of the canyon. As humans, we just fall short. We can't make it on our own efforts. The Bible says that even the best person on earth still has still sinned at some point in deed or attitude or rebellion against God and therefore cannot stand in the presence of a perfect holy God on the basis of his or her, her own merit. However, God loves us so much that he became the man Jesus and died on the cross for our sin. Romans 6.23 states, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We cannot make it on our own. We need a Savior, and God has provided one. Now we accept what Jesus did on the cross on our behalf and put control of our lives into his hands. We can have a relationship with God, with the God who made us. We must trust Jesus as Lord and Savior and receive him by our own personal invitation. Revelations 3.20 states, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. To eat with someone in this verse demonstrates intimate fresh friendship. This is the kind of relationship that God desires to have with us. It is critically important to trust in Jesus alone for your salvation. I would like to believe <clears throat> that Christianity is just one of many ways to God, but this is not possible if Jesus really was who he claimed to be. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Just before the crucifixion, Jesus prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Yet there was no other way for us to be restored to God. Jesus had to go to the cross. Christianity is, in, is unique in that Jesus claimed to be God and to pay the penalty for our sins. There is no way that in of ourselves we can work our way to God as other religions teach. 
Ephesians 2, 8, verses 8 to 9 states, For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, faith, and this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. In of myself, I don't claim to be smarter or better than others. Actually, I believe that most of the people I know are smarter and more talented than I am. I try to say and do the right things, but frequently fail. The Bible says that the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord. I am constantly aware of my need for God's mercy, grace, and help in my life. However, one thing I know, beyond any doubt, is that in June 1972, Jesus Christ entered my life, and my life dramatically and permanently changed at that point. No one who really knew me well before that point can deny what happened. Now, I'm not asking you to believe based on my experience. However, I am saying that you should consider the claims of Christ. If you think there is any, that there is any chance that Jesus could be real, then it is worth a wholehearted investigation. There are eternal implications. The Bible says that we will find God when we seek for him with all our heart. It cannot be simply an intellectual exercise. Although we shouldn't give up our, we shouldn't give up our intellect, we should take time to consider the evidence and ask God to reveal the truth to us. The Bible says to taste and see that the Lord is good. Almost every person I know who has taken the time to read the Bible and seriously considered it has become a Christian. This includes people who started out with very anti-Christian beliefs. In the next video, I'll wrap up some of these ideas and suggest some things to look at if you would like to consider the claims of Christ. As I mentioned at the beginning of this video, my desperate plea is that you will be willing to take the time to seek him and find out if he really is who he claimed to be.